The Australian Work Health and Safety Regulations provide guidelines on how to apply the provisions of its accompanying piece of legislation, the Work Health and Safety Act. Among others, the regulations cover such details as definitions, general workplace risk management, guidelines for hazardous work environments, dealing with hazardous substances and materials, and how to respond to major incidents. Each chapter is further categorised into parts and divisions for ease of reference. For example, RCDs are covered in Division 6 of Part 4.7, which is contained within Chapter 4 of the regulations. A handy tool for finding where a topic is referenced in a long PDF, such as the Work Health and Safety Regulations, is to use Adobe's search function. Type a keyword relating to your topic into the search and click Next to scroll through each mention of this word until you've found the area which relates most closely to the question. In your assessment, questions marked 1A to E ask you to provide a reference to each issue from the Work Health and Safety Regulations. A copy of the regulations is provided in the learning material. Codes of practice show us how to apply the standards set out in the Work Health and Safety Act and regulations. They are a useful tool in work health and safety training situations. Codes of practice can also be referred to in order to issue fines or in court situations to determine if work health and safety issues have been met. An occupational health and safety management system is the system responsible for the practical implementation and enforcement of OHS policies and procedures. Simply put, it's a system to incorporate legislative safety requirements into operations carried out in the workplace. Initially, performance targets of the system get laid out. For example, zero workplace deaths, or maybe from a legal perspective, a clean work health and safety record. In order to achieve the targets, an implementation plan is then created and then carried out. The effectiveness of the system must be continually monitored and improvements made where necessary. The integration of an OHS management system into a company's existing management system is a complex process with many different aspects to it. Existing procedures are to be analysed from the perspective of work health and safety, with procedures modified where necessary. Designation of responsibilities are to be clearly outlined for accountability, and communication to the relevant staff of their responsibilities and how to uphold them is to be conducted via training. Hazard management is a core component to the system, as are disaster contingency and response plans. A system of supporting documentation is to be created to aid with system monitoring and accountability. There are a number of OHS management system records which organisations are required to keep by law. Among others, these include training, hazardous areas, radiation, high-risk work licences, carcinogenic substances. Supervisors are largely responsible for the implementation of policies and procedures involved in the OHS MS. The monitoring and control of risks, as well as instruction and training, also fall within their domain. In order to set up and maintain an effective occupational health and safety management system, there should be an open line of communication between management and workers regarding issues like hazard identification and control, reviewing the effectiveness of controls, reviewing or developing policies and procedures, incident investigation. Workplace hazards vary according to the location and nature of your work. It's important to conduct hazard assessments whenever there's been a change to your working situation. As part of their occupational health and management system, Rio Tinto requires employees to fill out a Take 5 form before commencement of work, as well as in the event that a change has taken place. 
The form lists out typical hazards as a series of checkboxes to be ticked or crossed depending on whether the hazard is present. If a hazard is present, then you are required to state what control is in place to minimise the hazard. When determining the best control to use for a given hazard, you can refer to the hierarchy of control. At the top of the hierarchy is elimination. If we can get rid of the hazard entirely, that is the most effective way to control it. An example of hazard elimination would be to use material handling equipment rather than have workers handle the equipment manually. If elimination is not possible, then you move down the hierarchy to substitution. The work you are undertaking may require the use of a hazardous substance. Substitution would entail replacing the hazardous substance for a less hazardous one. Next in the hierarchy is engineered controls. These measures involve creating systems and structures which isolate people from the hazard. For example, remotely controlling a process inside a hazardous area. Below these are administrative controls. Administrative controls change the way in which people go about the task through procedures and signage. Performing road work at night, where possible, is a policy aimed at minimising road safety incidents. The least effective control method is the use of personal protective equipment. This includes equipment such as hard hats, respirators and safety glasses. PPE is a last resort control measure which only limits your exposure to the risk. Most often a combination of control measures are used to increase control effectiveness. The more control measures put in place, the lower the risk becomes. When working at heights, it might be required that workers tether their tools to themselves in order to prevent them from falling on workers below. However, it's still reasonable to enforce a policy of wearing hard hats. When all reasonable control measures have been put in place, the risk is said to be a LARP, or as low as reasonably possible. When assessing a risk, a good place to start is to categorise it according to its likelihood and its severity or consequence. The likelihood is the probability that the risk will occur. Severity relates to the consequence of the risk occurring. The severity of getting crushed by a vending machine while purchasing a snack is extremely high. You could potentially die. However, the likelihood of a vending machine falling on you is extremely low. Worldwide, the vending machine fatality rate is 2.18 people per year. When you weigh the likelihood against the severity, you can see that vending machines don't pose a significant risk to society. You can conduct a basic workplace risk assessment by identifying all possible risks and assigning them with severity and likelihood ratings. Risks with higher ratings require more immediate action than those with lower ratings. The risk rating will then dictate how you deal with the risk. Tasks with unreasonably high risk ratings are not to be performed until the controls have been put in place which would lower the risk to a more manageable category. To control something, you must be able to monitor it. OHS management systems are no different. Feedback about the system's effectiveness is integral in the OHSMS's optimization. Feedback can come in the form of hazard identification, the effectiveness of control measures, and the effectiveness of the management approach as a whole. Feedback can assist in the prioritization of risks and the allocation of resources to the mitigation of those risks. The data collected can be used to predict trends across time and different locations enabling predictive measures to be put in place. OHS information is constantly evolving. Incidents occur which lead to improved policies and practices. In order for this information to take effect, it needs to be effectively communicated to the workforce. Some communication methods may include brochures, bulletin boards or notice boards, charts, checklists, 
handbooks, internet, meetings, newspapers, presentations, registers, reports, and weekly team briefings. To ensure tasks are carried out in a competent and safe manner, an organisation's workforce requires training. In order to determine the type of training required for each category of your workforce, a training needs analysis needs to be carried out. This can then aid in creating a training budget estimate and a training schedule. The training needs analysis can also determine the training given during inductions, as well as at routine workplace meetings. New equipment will often require those using it to be trained in its specifics. More general training, such as first aid, is best conducted staff-wide at set intervals. Where possible, formal work procedures should be followed in carrying out routine tasks. This ensures the work is carried out in a safe manner with a consistent outcome. The information contained within a formal work procedure should include the instructions for carrying the job out correctly and safely, any hazards associated with the job, and how to prevent injury, any equipment to be used and how to use it correctly, what to do if an incident occurs. According to the Work Health and Safety Act, a person who conducts a business or undertaking must ensure that the regulator is notified immediately after becoming aware that a notifiable incident arising out of the conduct of the business or undertaking has occurred. A notifiable incident is defined in the Act as A. The death of a person B. Serious injury or illness of a person C. A dangerous incident When an OHS incident occurs, it's important to investigate the incident to prevent its reoccurrence. Root cause analysis is an investigative method aimed at uncovering the root cause of that incident. The investigation begins at the incident, where the event is defined and described. This will uncover a causal factor, which explains why the event happened. This causal factor may then have its own cause, and so on. Once you work your way through this causal chain, you will eventually arrive at the root cause of the incident. The root cause is identified by the absence of a dependence on causal factors. Fixing the root cause will eliminate the causal chain which culminated in the incident's occurrence. If you attempt to fix the problem at the causal factor level instead of the root cause level, you may only temporarily fix the problem. When conducting root cause analysis, it's important to realise that there may be multiple causes to an incident, as well as multiple root causes. Let's look at an example. A newly trained forklift driver spins out of control, destroying property and injuring a fellow worker. Upon investigation, it was found that the forklift truck wasn't properly serviced and needed a new set of brake pads. It was then discovered that the truck missed the past two scheduled services due to excessive demand for the truck. It was thus concluded that excessive forklift demand along with an ineffective equipment maintenance policy were the two root causes of the incident. An extra forklift truck was purchased and a more robust maintenance policy was introduced as a response to the investigation.